feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye in audio torium of audacity. I'm your resident weirdo, your host, DJ BJ Turnoff, representing Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. We got one hell of a Halloween edition for you tonight, my little demons. Kevin McQueen, author and instructor at Eastern Kentucky University, will unveil some dark and disturbing American tales from his own personal collection. Some of the stories are from his latest book, Weird Wild West, which shows that not only should that time period be remembered for its cowboys and gun battles, but just as infamous for its ghost stories, unexplained deaths, and bizarre murders. Kevin will give us a few unforgettable tales, like the body snatching of Billy the Kid and the crazy axe-murdering cult. We'll also expand the conversation to cover some other historical true crime and paranormal stories that have been witnessed across the states. This one's not really for the faint of heart, people. We'll be right back in a Mind's Eye moment. Scaring up a good time here on the Mind's Eye Halloween show. Like many of you, I love haunted houses during the Halloween season, and generally I'm not really too scared of them. I I just kind of laugh my way through them, but uh, I think there's one that I found that I don't even think you could pay me to do. McCamey Manor in Summertown, Tennessee is so extreme that no one has ever successfully completed the experience. Uh, To even step foot in it, you have to watch a two-hour-long video. I'm definitely not going to do that. Uh, Sign a 40-page waiver. Oh, hell no. Create a safe word. Okay, check. Long time ago. Uh, And then also pass a physical. Barely, but okay. Hard pass for me, but uh, if you dare tempt yourself, then get the information now at our Facebook and Twitter pages, at Minds Eye Show. I also double dog dare you to check out our own House of Horrors over at the MindsEyeMedia.com. You can preview right now some of the eerie tales that Kevin McQueen's going to share on the other side of this break. This is the Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio. Joining the Mind's Eye now is Kevin McQueen, author of several books covering history, true crime, folklore, ghost lore, and more. Appreciate your headline in the Halloween episode tonight, Kevin. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. I'm very glad to be on. Uh, pleasure's all ours here, and uh, it's going to be a real fun episode tonight. Um, probably uh, have some violent stories to tell, but still fun nonetheless, <laughs> for sure. Uh, <laughs> so uh, before we get into the stories tonight, let's go down a little bit of your psychopathy here. What, uh, what started you down this path? Kind of what, what turned you on about writing about strange historical events? Uh, it's kind of hard to say. It's been a lifelong interest ever since a uh, very early childhood. I'm not really sure where it comes from. And normally people sometimes have a story, you know, I kind of got into doing some, uh, into like ghost and I guess I, had, I didn't have a ghost experience, but some of my little, you know, some of my friends as a little kid had one. So I figured that might be a little story behind there, but uh, I guess you'll have to take that out in therapy, get it out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a lot of your books focus on the United States, uh, this newest one, weird, wild west, true tales of the strange and Gothic. Uh, you have a, a quite a bit of violent stories as I alluded to before. And uh, as a student of history, historically speaking, um, which state did you find to be the most violent? I, I, if I had to really choose one, maybe Texas. There seems to have been <laughs> an awful lot of Texas stories that I found while I was doing my research. Yeah. Oh, yeah, quite a bit. And we'll get into a couple of those um, in, in just a few moments. I guess uh, every time I read something or hear something about something idiotic occurred, my first thought is always Florida. Um Sorry, Florians. <laughs> uh, I guess it's a little true, though. But uh, what about historically speaking? Did you find one state to be, um, I guess, it more idiotic than, than the others? Not really. It just seems um, anywhere there's a frontier, there seems to be a lot of violence. And, of course, everywhere in the U.S. was the frontier at some point. Now, you're based in Kentucky, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, but that state and some of the stranger things that happened there. You've highlighted uh, in, in quite a few, bo- few of your books here. Um, and, and one thing that you highlight a lot in your books is that truth really is stranger than fiction. Um, tell me a, a, a truth is stranger than fiction story about your home state there, Kentucky. Oh, there would be so much to choose from. Wow. It would be very hard to pick just one. I have a lot of stories in my books about strange murders, uh, bizarre modes of death, giant skeletons. Kentucky appears to have been 
quite a place for giant skeleton findings. Uh, give us uh, an example of that. Well, uh, right here in the county where I live, one of the best documented cases of a giant human skeleton being found was in 1895. It was, uh, I wish I had the book with me. I can't remember the exact height of the skeleton, but it was uh, much longer than someone at the time who was over six feet, which in 1895 would have been a very tall person. Um, several scientific organizations examined the skeleton and authenticated it. And one of the really strange things is that I, I teach dual credit classes at a local high school. And one of the people there, it turns out that the skeleton was found on his ancestor's land. So it was sort of a family story. Uh, did you ever see the bones itself? No. One of the strange things is that uh, it seems like in almost every single case, the bones are gone. And whatever happened to them is something of a mystery. And I guess that's kind of a, a common pattern that that we do see with that, because I mean, there were quite a few stories about giant bones uh, in America that were found uh, in the late 1800s, uh, you know, in weird Wild West. I think one was um, Nevada's Lovelock Giant. I mean, you would think that there was a, a lot of giants, uh, giant bones found in the 1800s, you know, according to the stories you found. Yeah, there, there really are. It, it really becomes kind of creepy because you'll find one old newspaper account of a story like that and you'll make track of it. And then you'll find another one, and then you'll find another one, and then another one. And after a certain point, you just kind of have to wonder what, what was going on there. And what's your opinion? Do you think that they were giant bones or, or just misidentified? It's really hard to say. In many cases, or in some cases, it's very possible that they misidentified some, some animal. But there are cases where they actually found skulls, and of course a human skull rounded and uh, with the round eyes and all those uh, sorts of features, not something that you really see in other creatures. And what's your personal opinion? Do you, do you think that they really existed at some point? Uh, you know, a whole land of giants or, or a tribe of giants? I mean, what are your thoughts there? I don't really know. I can never really seem to make up my mind firmly about these things. It just sort of depends on my mood. It just strikes me that there are a, a great many stories for all these people to be liars or simply making it up or simply mistaking some animal bones for human bones. But on the other hand, you always wonder, so why didn't anybody save these bones? Where are they? Where are they now? Yeah, and, there's a, and some of the stories that you included going back to uh, the Lovelock Giant one is that, uh, you know, the source that you're referencing says that the bones are somewhere in a private museum in, I guess it's pronounced uh, Winnemucca. Um, I mean, have you ever verified um, that story or, or any other giant story? No, I've never been able to completely verify one. You know, today, when, whenever you do hear stories, uh, you know, about finding giants or, or referencing older stories, they always talk about how the Smithsonian would, would take the um, bones and then, you know, you know, pun intended, I guess, uh, buried and buried in, out of sight. Uh, but that one story, the Lovelock giant one, is almost the exact opposite where, you know, he alerted the Smithsonian and they didn't have any interest in it at all and just kind of ignored it. And it's, it's interesting how sometimes contradictions like that appear as well. Yeah, that's true. And I've also heard stories about Smithsonian or other scientific organizations taking the skeletons and never returning them. I've never seen one that was really authenticated, but I've heard that. Yeah, if if true, maybe that maybe that explains where all the skeletons went, and they're no longer <laughs> any for us to examine. But you never know; someday someone may be digging a well or something, and they may find a new one. Yeah, who knows? And you know, to me, I guess personally, I don't I don't really think it's that hard to believe that maybe once that there there was a time when humans were just bigger. I mean, in, in prehistoric times, and um, or that there was you know tr different tribes of giants throughout the land. I don't think that's something that's so far stretched to believe but you know obviously we all need that that evidence to back it up so. it's true well it's entirely possible and i noticed a lot of the times that the ones that were buried seem to have been buried with great ceremony so it could be that they were celebrated and uh, even at the time among the tribes were considered leaders and were therefore given special burial all right, well, let's get back a little bit more to you and and some of the stories from weird wild west and your your latest book 
uh, in it. We're going to go back to your home state here for a little bit. Uh, I'm not picking on your home state. I'm, I'm a big fan in the little time that I've spent there, actually. Uh, but you describe one town, Elizabethtown, uh, as a ghost town because of its uh, supposedly because it's so supposedly active and kind of weird coincidence, uh, Kevin. Uh, I was there to investigate the Elizabethtown Masonic Lodge uh, because it's supposedly so haunted. You ever been there? No. I, well, I've been to Elizabethtown, but I've never been to the lodge. Oh, you got to get there. Do, do you ever do things like that? I mean, you, you talk about so many different, you know, ghost lore and mythology. I mean, have you ever yourself done any like, you know, I guess paranormal investigation of sorts? Strangely enough, I've never really done one. I've been to Waverly Hills a couple of times, but not really, you know, with equipment or anything like that. I'd like to go back sometime as a private tour with very few people, because uh, when I went, there were just so many people there that I couldn't help think if anything's around, it's not going to come out. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, I feel like they're just like humans. Some people, if, if they do exist, then uh, ghosts exist. And just like humans, some people don't like to be around people. Some people love to be around people. So who knows? But uh, yeah, that's a Waverly Hills is a real, real creepy place. I've been there myself. So. Oh, it's really, really the, the spookiest place I've ever been in my life, whether it's really haunted or not. Just it's a very disturbing place. Why do you get that feeling spooky? Well, you know, it's like something out of a nightmare, a large abandoned hospital. It still has the cafeteria. It still has chairs. It still has rooms, windows. It's exactly like something out of a bad dream. <laughs> Anything... Uh, disturbing or unexplainable happened to you when you when you were there? Well, no. Um, I would have been very interested if something had. But again, there were so many people there that you hear footsteps and you're just not really sure. Was that a person? It could have been a person. And it would be better to examine the place by yourself or with a very small team of people. What, what about you personally? What do you believe? Uh, life after death ghosts. What, what do you think? Well, life after death, for sure. Ghosts, I'm not so certain about. Again, it, it, a lot of it depends on my mood, and I have days where I think they exist and days when I'm not really so sure. I did w uh, work for quite a while in a haunted house called Whitehall near Richmond, Kentucky, a very large 19th century mansion, which if you've never been there, I really recommend it. Um, it was owned by, built by Cassius Clay, the Emancipationist, and I was a guide there for uh, nearly a decade, and uh, quite a number of strange things happened there. I never actually saw a ghost, but there were some things that I heard that were very odd. Well, like what? Well, we would, uh, we would hear the piano keys being uh, touched once in a while. And we would always examine these things to try to see if there was a natural explanation for it. Uh, there was just one week where two or three days the piano keys would turn a little, uh, click a little, play a note. But it never really did it again, not before and not since. It wasn't a windy day. We, there are no vibrations of the floor caused by machinery. We never really did figure that out. Yeah, what well, piano? That that's like sounds like a straight from like a horror film score right there. Oh no, I was just gonna say it was a really really old piano in 1849 Steinway, and it really didn't play anyhow. It just had a few keys that worked, but it was almost like something was coming along and touching the keys that did work. <laughs> and what about the history behind it? Uh, anything that would uh, you know, I guess try and, and match the history. Well, the owner, Cassius Clay, lived a pretty violent life. He was a, an emancipationist in a southern state, and he was in a number of fights and duels. He was wounded a number of times. The legend goes that he actually killed a couple of burglars in the house when he was 89 years old. And he also killed a man in self-defense, not on the grounds, but pretty close to the grounds. Sounds like one uh, tough SOB. Oh, he certainly was. Yeah, I, would, I definitely wouldn't mess him when he was 89, for sure. He's just beating up burglars coming into his place. Jeez, wow. Um, <laughs> he married a 15-year-old when he was 84. Uh, I'm going to leave that there and say no yeah. comment on that one. <laughs> but, you know, that was indicative of the time. So it's, you know, everything. I guess there's the idea of cultural relativism. I mean, that's a huge 
huge age gap. But uh, I mean, to say that marrying a 15 year old at the time was wasn't that uncommon. It's true. Uh, that was really quite common at the time. And judging from the papers of the era that I read, it really wasn't her age that bothered people. It was his age. <laughs> yeah, Mary 15 was no big deal. Yeah, what do you, you think she was? Uh, you know, I hate to use this term, uh, a gold digger, you know? Well, it's funny you should mention it, but evidently she was, or at least her family was. Her brother was a sharecropper on Clay's land. And apparently that's how he met her. And there have been indications that the family was hoping to get some money from him, some valuable furniture. He was really quite kind to her. And even after they divorced, he built a house for her and gave her furniture. So he kept her um, he kept her up even after their divorce. Yeah, if you're 15 and you, you you're gonna have sex with an 84 year old, you I think you've earned that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that little piece of, you've of earned, land. Yeah, you've earned your vine covered cottage with with uh, fully furnished. <laughs> I guess to continue picking on uh, Kentucky as I have been, and we're gonna go to other regions uh, momentarily. Uh, just one thing that I I thought was interesting in Elizabethtown how. There was uh, an early H.H. H. Holmes, uh, you know, supposedly America's first serial killer. Uh, in reality, he was not. And serial killers were much more common in the eighty in the 1800s than we're probably led to believe. Oh, absolutely. I think we've always had them. It's just we never really had a term for them. Yeah, I would say that's probably the most modern thing about serial killers is really just the term. Um, you know, for you gave uh, two examples, one Elizabethtown with the uh, boarding house operator uh, who with the disappearing renters and then Denver had its own Jack the Ripper. Uh, why don't you share a little bit about one of those cases? Well, the Denver case was really very interesting. And it was a series sort of like Jack the Ripper of prostitute murders in the late 1890s, uh, early to mid 1890s. Uh, the, they were strangled with a towel and that's how they figured out it was the same killer each time. And one of the really creepy details about it was uh, there was a local fortune teller who said that she was having a vision of what the killer looked like and she would go public with it. And then someone strangled her with a towel. So the best guess was that the actual killer got frightened, possibly believed she could really identify him and killed her before she could do it. Uh, but uh, well, he, the T or she, I guess, uh, was never identified then. No, never identified. But one that was serial killer wise, or, or at least is led to believe, you open the book Weird Wild West uh, with the story of Clementine uh, in Texas uh, about uh, and her supposed story of the Church of Sacrifice. Uh, do you remember the details on, on, on that chilling story? Well, uh, her name was Clementine. I'm, it's a sort of a Cajun French name. I think it's Bernabe is probably how it's pronounced. Um, she was caught, uh, said she was part of a, a cult of axe murdering, uh, axe murderers who just went from Texas to Louisiana to other states. Um, she was African American. The victims were, the church allegedly was. It's a really mixed up weird story. Uh, it's really hard to say what she did and what she didn't do. There, there was never any proof that came forward that she was telling the truth about the cult. But the victims were certainly real. And in at least one case, she left some bloody clothes behind. So I believe she killed at least one family. But how much of the rest of, it, of, her, of her confession was imagination and how, how much was true, it's not really easy to say now. How many people did she say she killed? I, if I remember correctly, she said up in the 20s. The, the, the tally kept varying, which was one of the things that makes it sort of suspicious. I think she said the 20s at one point and 30-something at another point. Almost all of the victims were families. Whoever did the killing killed entire families with an axe. And she was saying that it was connected to a, a larger cult of, of, I guess, axe murderers. And yeah. Um, and but when she was arrested, so there was these murders before she was arrested, and yet at the same time, while and after she's arrested, 
uh, there was other axe murderers going um, murders going on. I mean, do you think that they were connected, uh, a copycat killer, or evidence that there was this church of uh, axe murderers? That that's an interesting point. Even after she was arrested, the murders continued, and what were uh, very similar, very likely the same series continuing. And uh, it's a sort of hard to say. Obviously, it couldn't have been her doing the later ones because she was in jail. But if she was part of a cult, they might have continued for a while or they might have been copycats or it could have been someone entirely different. It's, it's so hard to to tell, you know, obviously, when you're just reading about it, uh, you know, a century and a half later. Do you find that to be, I guess, somewhat of a, a frustrating aspect of your research that, you know, you can only verify so much? That's true. Uh, the old newspapers, they're detailed in some ways, in some ways they're not. And they had a really bad habit of bringing up a really good story and then suddenly dropping it and never reporting the uh, aftermath or what happened later. And you're just sort of left hanging, wondering what happened. And you just have to sort of put clues together and speculate. But whenever I speculate, I always say that I'm speculating so people won't think it's absolutely true. Uh, but I find that uh, when you do do that, there is a good evidence that you support that with. Um, so you, you, you're good at the, you're great at the research. And, you know, speaking of that research, it's pretty backbreaking. You you're literally looking at microfilms, aren't you, sometimes? Yes, that's pretty much how I do all of it. Uh, I've just had a, ha a hobby for about excuse me, a hobby for about 20 years now of going through the old Louisville Courier Journal on microfilm at my university's library. Whenever I have the free time, I just go through it issue by issue and uh, make notes in a laptop on stories that sound pretty good and noting the dates and the page numbers. It's like watching a story unfold sometimes. Uh, and, you know, staying with that uh, Clementine story uh, and, and with that idea that, you know, you weren't were or were not able to verify you know, one of the motives that she had was supposedly that, uh, for her killings was necrophilia. I mean, did you find that to be true? Was that verified at all? What a, was there any truth to that story? Well, it came out at the trial, and uh, she it, she actually confessed to it. And it just struck me as one of those things that sounded really pretty convincing. Not this kind of thing I think you would make up if it weren't true. So apparently that would have been her motive or part of her motive. It wasn't robbery. Unless she was, unless she's just completely insane and and just is talking, you know, batshit crazy stuff. So oh, that's also possible. And that's another things you can't verify. I mean, you, there's no way you can verify whether someone is sane or or what. You know, I can say is okay. This this seems pretty insane. So <laughs> right, uh, that's one of the frustrating things. You can get details from the old papers, but sometimes they're contradictory. Sometimes they uh, don't give enough detail. Sometimes they bring up something and never finish finish the story, and you just have no idea what really happened. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Valeska axe murders that took place in Iowa in 1912, but an author named William James has written a book in which he suggests that a lot of the murders that Clementine took credit for were really done by the Valeska axe murderer, which was a book I didn't read until after my book came out. And now reading that, what uh, what are, what are your thoughts there? Was that possibly connected? Um, were those was that who was behind the other murders? I think he makes a pretty good case, but I really do think Clementine killed at least one family. The rest of it, not really sure about. Well, uh, let's 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 take a quick break there. Um, we've had a quite a bit of the we i think we need a little break from the uh the violence uh when we get back <laughs> when we, yeah yeah we we talk a lot well quite frankly we're going to actually talk a little bit more about some violent stories here but we're also going to throw in a smidge of some paranormal stuff some ghosts uh some cryptids and uh, and, and so much more we'll be right back on this uh, special halloween episode with author kevin mcqueen we are back with kevin mcqueen author of Weird Wild West, True Tales of the Strange and Gothic, and, and so many other books. Uh, it's hard to keep count. We're going to get to a, we're going to touch on a few of those other books uh, momentarily, but uh, let's stick with Weird Wild Wild uh, Weird Wild West for a moment. Uh, I, I mean, there are so many stories about lynchings, hangings, and I mean all this other type of street justice that you I think you designated a category called uh, vintage violence. I mean, you you would think that there was a hanging every day in the in the Wild West then. 
Well, it certainly happened very often, sometimes legally, sometimes not. And it really wasn't just a Western thing. I've um, accounted a lot of murders, well, murder, well, yeah, you'd call it murders, lynchings and hangings from all over the U.S., really. But particularly in the South and the West and the Southwest, it didn't seem to happen that much in the other regions, although it certainly did at some time, did sometimes. And would you say the most most of the lynchings were racially based or was it lawfully based in the sense that someone thought that, you know, you um, you know, you did something illegal and now they're going to take their justice just by, by their own hand? Or uh, what, what do you think most of the lynchings were um, based around? Um, probably both, actually. There were a lot of cases uh, where the lynchings were clearly racially based, but there were also a lot of cases where they were simply impatient, I think. For the criminals to go to trial and i guess their thought was was if they really made an example of somebody that would cut down on the crime rate a lot of time though the racially motivated ones you you know you automatically are going to think uh white towards you know blacks but um you found that uh, that there were also some black rated uh black uh, you know gangs uh black gangs doing lynchings as well yeah that was one of the big surprises Uh, one of the wonderful things about going through the old newspapers is you find all these things you're just not really expecting and not really looking for and i remember i found a case of a black lynch mob from 1903 and i thought well that's very strange and interesting so i made a note of the date and the place and then i found another example and then another one and then another one and by the time i uh, collected them all for a book I believe I counted up almost, I can't remember now how many cases I had. It was well over 100, though. And since I wrote that book, I've actually found more cases. So it certainly wasn't as unusual as we might think. And were those black-on-black crimes? Were they black-on-white crimes? What were were most of the nature of those? Most of them were black-on-black crimes, but I did find cases where they would lynch white people. And I found cases where black-and-white mobs together would lynch people. So obviously it's a little more complicated, I think, than history books have let on. Yeah, nothing nothing brings people together more than uh, acts of violence and murder, <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess one thing that the book really, you know, Weird Wild West, you know, hearing all these violent stories and all these crazy crimes, hangings, lynchings, uh, that it really gives you an appreciation for today's police force, in my opinion. I mean, I know that they get a, a pretty bad rep these days, and I really do think that 99% you know, percent of them are doing the right thing. But, I mean, people, it just makes it, when reading these stories, it, it makes you realize how hard uh, it was to, to live in the wild, wild west, when really there was just like a sheriff responsible for, for doling out the law. Uh, I mean, did you have a, a similar feeling as well? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, it's like... There'll be we'll just pick on the one person who does something wrong and forget about all the others who did it right. And a lot of these sheriffs had to watch over not just a town, but entire territories. In the days before telephones, before cell phones, and when there was really no quick and easy way to get get help. So they had a terrible job, I'm sure. It really highlights the book. Um, and all really a lot of your books that that we humans are are just violent beings uh, but kind of staying with that idea is that in my opinion you know i think that just focusing on america because that's what your books focus on that i mean i think that we're we might be safer now more than ever on a day-to-day basis um although perception is obvious what's your opinion i think you're right i've read some studies on that in fact we always have a feeling that we're living in the most violent times right now and we're always in constant danger. But what really is going on here is we have instant access to news. We know what's going on all over the USA thanks to the Internet just seconds ago, and we're left with this impression of violence when, in fact, violence has been decreasing constantly, especially in the last 20 years or so. It's not the impression you get looking at the internet, internet news. Yeah, now there's just, I feel like there's just more exposure now than ever. Uh, and that feeds into the perception that w- w- this is a, maybe the most dangerous time. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I agree that, you know, I think that 
really we're in a safer time more more than ever because of that exposure it's just you know if you if you put on 10 minutes worth of news obviously it's gonna make you think otherwise so True, and interestingly enough, this even happened before the Internet because uh, I'm now going through newspapers from the 1840s, right around the time the telegraph was invented. And before the telegraph, you would just get local news. You might get news from another state, but it would be from two weeks, three weeks ago. With the telegraph, you start getting news that's very recent, that happened very close by. And I'm already seeing editorials about how, oh, crime is exploding. And no, what's really going on is, is they're just getting news a lot faster. Yeah, it's funny, I have that actual belief, um, but it's also juxtaposed next to the idea that, you know, there's, there is always that overhanging idea of nuclear death could happen in any moment at the same time so well, that's, <laughs> i didn't have to worry about that <laughs> yeah it's a, i guess it's a funny contradiction how you know I, like i say you know it is safer but really we could die at the drop of a hat at any moment really true but <laughs> of course on the other hand they had um pestilences like cholera outbreaks which absolutely wiped out people by the tens of thousands and that's something that we really don't have to worry about at least by and large until some new disease comes along with no cure for it. Another huge issue that, or, or fear was premature burials. I mean, people were legitimately terrified of being buried alive. And one story that stuck out in my head from we were Wild West was uh, the burial of John Stink in 1800s uh, Oklahoma. Well, he was an Indian, and I can't remember the tribe off the top of my head, but his real name was John Go After Fish, but he was prematurely buried. They buried him under a cairn of rocks, and somehow he crawled his way out through the rocks and made it back to the tribe, but they refused to believe he was alive. They kept insisting he was a ghost, and they renamed him John Stink. And even worse, they kept his possessions. They kept his horses, saying, well, ghosts have no use for these things. So it left him a very embittered man. He, he became very wealthy, I believe, from gold, or not gold, but from oil. But he had the name John Stink the rest of his life. Yeah, I guess you got to wear that one with pride uh, compared to the yeah. alternative. So it's it's the kind of name that will stick with you. You'll never get rid of it. Uh, you know, another story that stuck with me uh, was that there was somebody who was buried uh, prematurely, and then for whatever reason. They ended up, I guess, like, you know, a few weeks later going and un taking out the, the um, taking out the coffin. And they found that it was, you know, that there were scratch marks from the inside and the linen was being torn. Do you remember that one? I think that was a Utah story, yes, but I'm yes. absolutely sure. Uh, premature burial. It's another one of those topics. It just makes your skin crawl no matter who you are. And every now and then we hear people say, well... People were just um, worried about it back then, but they they just blew it out of proportion, the same way we blow some things out of proportion now. But going through all the old newspapers, I just kept finding case after case after case. So I don't think it was an overblown fear at all. I think it happened quite often. And, and it was so, and people were so scared of it at that time that, if I recall correctly, there was coffins being built with some type of breathing apparatus just in case did oh, it's true definitely true and some of my books i even have stories about those um, i've got one called new england nightmares it goes into considerable detail and horror in the heartland about some of the really strange devices people would uh, be buried with to make sure they weren't buried alive if you read a lot of old wills from the time you'll see people saying things like make sure that i am kept above ground three days before burial, or slash my wrists, shoot me in the head, that sort of thing. And, of course, they were afraid of being buried alive. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of one of my biggest fears is being buried alive. It just seems like uh, maybe the most horrific way to go. I think so, and people still fear it, even though, of course, with embalming and that sort of thing, it's virtually impossible, and yet we still can't get over that fear. It's a really primal thing. And that's uh, something that you look into, in, I believe, in uh, another one of your books. Um, what is it? Gothic and Strange Ooh. Tales of the South, where one of the chapters, yes. I believe, is Distinctive Demises. Give a couple examples of people who kind of, 
I guess, med their maker accident or by design in some pretty horrific ways. Oh, there are just so many of them. It's, you know, like when someone says, tell me a joke, and you're thinking of 5,000 jokes at once, and you can't center on one. Um, I seem to remember one from Kentucky. It was almost like something from a Warner Brothers cartoon. A guy was setting off dynamite to clear stumps from his land, and he had one stick of dynamite that wouldn't go off. So he went over and picked it up and looked at it, and then it went off, exactly like happens to Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> oh, maybe that's what uh, the character was based on, for all we know. Hmm? You never know. And 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 but going back to the joke thing, you say when someone says, "Tell me a joke," I always have one ready for them. I have one, so um, I'm going to give it to you right now. What did uh, the Pink Panther say when he stepped on an ant? I don't know. Dead ant. Dead ant. Dead ant. Dead ant. <laughs> dead ant. Dead ant. All right. Sorry. I just, uh, <laughs> and I think half our listeners just uh, tuned out after that one. Apologies. All right. Let's get back to some more weird, uh, wild West stories. We've talked a lot of negative ones. Let's let's see if we can get a couple positive ones in there. Um, there was one story about uh, the saving of 250 souls who were deserted in a blizzard in North Dakota. Uh, that was probably common at the time, getting stuck in, in the, on a, a train and a railroad in the middle of nowhere and then being abandoned by your conductor. Oh, right. I do remember that one. Uh, boy, what a story. It was an epic, almost. A very short epic. It would make a good movie, <laughs> though. Uh, it happened quite often. Of course, weather forecasting was in its infancy, and a large number of people, 250 or so, were on a train, and a blizzard came, and just they, they, they couldn't go. And the train got covered with snow, not entirely covered, but they were all on board the train with very little food and no heating source. And it seemed like they could possibly be stuck in there for days. Uh, one man aboard became so terrified and so claustrophobic that he cut his own throat. He did survive, though. And one person on board the train, it turned out, was an electrician. And in the book, I compared this to modern-day hacking. He managed to get out of the train and found a telegraph wire and sent a message that they were stuck. And even though it was a terrible blizzard, a rescue train managed uh, to make its way through and found them. But that could have been really, really... You just have to wonder where that could have gone if no one had found them. 250 people stuck on a train running out of food with no heat. Mm. Yeah, there would have been one fat person just left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very large survivor. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that was uh, for, you know. Hopefully, that guy who uh, who was able to, you know to do the, the the old school hacking will say. Uh, hopefully, that they were he was in somebody's will. He became rich. People gave him money. Uh, hopefully, you know he got something in in return for for being the one who let everybody pretty much survive. He was definitely a hero. If I remember correctly, um, I couldn't find his name. I wanted to find his name. But a lot of the old accounts, another sort of a flaw with the old papers, they don't always give you names when you want names. Mm, the unnamed hero. He's... Yeah, he, he needs a statue. I got to get on another book just for a moment because um, I'm greedy and I lived in California. So I want to talk a, just for a moment about creepy California. You, you, you noted in there that... Uh, Stanford has uh, Stanford University has a secret collection of occult memorabilia. Damn, I wish I uh, I wish I knew that when I was living there. What type of what type of collectibles do they have there? Well, the story goes that uh, Leland Stanford was the founder of the university, and he had a brother who lived in Australia who was really into the occult, and he collected occult materials. And he willed them to the university. Well, the university didn't really want to put all these weird things on display, but at the same time, they didn't want to insult the family of their founder. So I've never been able to uh, find proof of it, but the story goes that the material was all stuck away in a secret room in one of the university buildings. And a couple of writers in the 1960s claimed that they actually got permission to see the secret room and they said they found things like uh, boxes of dried rat entrails and uh, wisps of, 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 of grass huh. and little materials that allegedly were, were um, materialized by ghosts and just stacks and stacks of occult books. 
did you ever call Stanford to just to ask them if they actually have it? No, but I should have. <laughs> I'll do, we'll look I guess uh, maybe I was afraid that they would say no and it would ruin a good story. Yeah, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? That's that's. Uh, you did it with the two writers in the '60s who claimed that they actually did see it, and they got um, help from one of the professors there at the time. So that just seems like the kind of thing that a, a, a staid professor at a noted university wouldn't get involved in, and even give his name unless there was some truth to it. I mean, I know that we just came, I know that you just came out with Weird Wild West, but. Um... What do you have next on the docket? Any Anything in the works right now, regionally? Well, I'm working on an all-Kentucky book, the first one in about seven years or so. And when can we expect that to be? And what's it going to be about? Anything specific? Well, I'm hoping, hoping it will come out next year. I, my goal is to have a book a year out. And so far, it's it's been a while since I missed a year. Um, I've offered it to the University Press of Kentucky and haven't heard back from them yet. Um, if they're not interested, though, I do have another couple of publishers that I think would like it. This is one that's not all creepy stories, not all paranormal <laughs> stories. There are some in it, but there are also things like uh, little-known stories about Abraham Lincoln and stories about Kentucky ghost towns. Could, uh, could I pry the Abraham Lincoln story out of you? Well, there was one story in there about his train, his own personal personal um, train car, car um, box car. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, he rode in a presidential box car with reinforced steel. As I said in the book, it's sort of the Air Force One of its time. It was only for presidential travel. Then after he died, it was never used again. It was uh, taken to Chicago, as I recall, and just sort of abandoned on a track. He has got a couple tra train-related stories, does he? And supposedly there's the, uh, and this is going to tie some ghosts into it, that there's you know, like the Abraham ghost train that uh, took his dead body around the uh, United States at the time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They report that, I think, in Springfield or near Springfield. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, obviously when you have a beloved person, uh, you're going to want them to linger uh, around. Uh, so that's, I think, explains why there's so many ghost stories of Abraham Lincoln or related as well. I think so. Yeah. It doesn't have any ghost stories about Lincoln, but it's got a lot of stories about um, things that he did when he was an attorney, some presidential stories that aren't very well known. Um, it's a well known story that he almost fought a duel, not too well known that he almost fought two duels. So I have the second duel story. And I found a good story from a woman who was actually married in the White House when Lincoln was president. Before I let you go, why don't you give out some of your um, information about where people can get the books and just, uh, you know, where they can get a little more about, about you as well. Uh, you can find uh, my, my uh, um, author website is kevinmcqueenstories.com. I should point out that my name is spelled K-E-V-E-N, not K-E-V-I-N. And I have two Facebook pages, Kevin D. McQueen, which is this general weird comedy stuff, and Kevin McQueen, which is the author page. And anytime I have book news or a new book out or anything, you can find it at the Kevin McQueen Facebook page. And you can find the books, a uh, pretty, pretty good number of sites on the Internet. You can also get them from your local, uh, local bookstores. All you have to do is order them. And you can get them directly from the publishers. And I've been published by about by five or six publishers. The last few have come from Indiana University Press, but also there was a couple from Pelican Press. And quite a few from History Press, now known as Arcadia Press. You're a real publisher whore, huh? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, boy. Let's go out on a bang, I guess, on that note, right? right. Uh, <laughs> uh, how about this? I'll give you a dealer's choice. Give me give me one of your uh, one of your more memorable stories from Weird Wild West, and then we'll, we'll go out on that note. Well, one of the stories that I've been telling, uh, and again, it's amazing what you find in these old papers. We've all heard of Billy the Kid, but I found an old newspaper clipping indicating that he might have been body snatched. Well, he was killed in July, I believe, 1881. And only a few days later, there came a story in the Las Vegas, New Mexico optic 
claiming that a local doctor had stolen the body from the grave, had boiled the flesh off the head, and had Billy the Kid's skull in his office, and the rest of the body was buried in a corral. And once the body naturally decomposed, the doctor was intending to put the skeleton together uh, for reasons unknown, my speculation is possibly to take it on the road and have people pay to see it, which was a pretty common form of entertainment. And uh, there were no follow-up stories, so I never found out if the story was true, but there were some things about it that made me think it is true. For example, the story didn't originate years and years and years after Billy the Kid's death. It originated only a few days afterward. And not only that, uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, I'm sure, was an extremely small town at the time, and there couldn't have been very many doctors there. So anyone who claims that a local doctor has stolen a body and has it in his corral is just begging for a libel suit, especially since all the authorities would have to do is go dig up the corral and see if there's a body there. Or if they open Billy the Kid's grave, they could see if his body was there. And did they do that? I never found any indication that they bothered to look in the grave to see if it was there. So it seems to me if they did something that sensational, there would have been a follow-up story. But unfortunately, we'll probably never know for sure because there was a flood in the area at the turn of the century. And Billy the Kid's grave is marked, but no one knows for sure where in the cemetery his grave actually is. So now it's no matter of just digging and looking and seeing if his body's there. Just but it was something that I'd never heard before. Yeah, that was I thought that was a really interesting story. And and your book and, and all your books are, are full of you know, filled with them. So definitely Thank highly you. recommend people uh picking up uh any of his books. Let's start with Weird Wild West, which we've been talking about, his newest one. Definitely go get it. Kevin, thank you so much for uh, for really, I guess, creeping me out on this uh, <laughs> Halloween edition no. of The Mind's Eye. That's what I love to do. <laughs> well, you, well uh, right. mission succeeded. Let's do it again next year. Okay, let's do. Thank you very much. No, thank you. And we'll be right back with The Mind's Eye wrap-up. Wrapping up here on The Mind's Eye, and if this episode didn't prove that truth really is stranger than fiction, people, I don't know what will. But if you need a, a little bit more proof, then tune into next week's show when we have legendary DEA agents Steve Murphy and Javier Pena. That's right. Those were the two Americans who were on the front lines taking down drug kingpin, murdering psychopath Pablo Escobar. Uh, their hunt for him was portrayed on the hit Netflix show Narcos. They're going to share some never heard before stories that weren't even put on the show. Until then, be well and let well be. I'm DJ BJ Turnoff signing off for the Mind's Eye on Stitcher Radio and Z Talk Radio.